Good afternoon, and thank you for attending today's webinar. My name is Jennifer Cooley, and I am the Education and Outreach Manager for the State Historical Museum. During 2021, the State Historical Society is commemorating the upcoming 175th anniversary of Iowa statehood. The Iowa History 101 webinar series, which focuses on the past lives of Iowans, continues on the second and fourth Thursdays throughout the year. You can learn more about this series and all of our programs on our website at iowaculture.gov. Please remember to sign up for each webinar you would like to attend, and don't worry if you can't watch live, all presentations will be recorded. Today we will he hear a few stories from the eight historic sites owned and operated by the State Historical Society of Iowa, as well as learn a few highlights visitors can discover when they see the sites in person. A few housekeeping points before I introduce our speaker. Everyone came into this webinar on mute with cameras off. Closed captions are available by clicking the closed caption button on your screen. The webinar is being recorded and will be placed on the Iowa Culture page of YouTube in a few days. I have disabled the chat function, but if you have any questions, please type them into the Q&A feature throughout the webinar. My colleague Matt Beyer is watching that feature and will prepare a list of questions for the speaker at the end of the presentation. But please note, we may not be able to get to all of the questions. And now I'm pleased to introduce our speaker, Michael Plummer. Michael is the Historic Sites Manager at the State Historical Society. He holds a Bachelor's of Business, Business Administration from Loyola University in Maryland and a Master's of Science in Historic Preservation from the University of Vermont. Despite an early career reminiscent of the movie Office Space, Mike eventually aligned his personal and professional interests holding positions at the Jane Addams Hull House Museum and the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. He also serves as a historic site museum board member and on various historic preservation commissions. And now I'm happy to turn it over to Michael to begin the webinar. Well, thank you very much, Jennifer, and, and good afternoon, everybody. It, it's great to be here talking to you all today. Uh, I am Mike Plummer uh, with the State Historical Society, where I'm the Historic Sites Manager. I also coordinate our Roadside Historical Marker Program and the Iowa Local History Network, which is a group of sort of history-focused organizations that exists to share information and resources. And whether you're talking about the historic sites, the historical markers, or the local history network, my role within the department is really to be location agnostic and, and meeting Iowans where they are uh, to connect them to the people, the, the places, and the points of pride that make the state unique. Uh, today, we're here to talk about uh, our historic sites. Uh, the State Historical Society owns eight historic sites across Iowa, spread from river to river to river, uh, and those sites cover thousands of years of history. The sites tell stories of extraordinary achievement as well as everyday life, and through them, visitors are introduced to how Iowa has shaped the American experience and how that history has in turn shaped Iowans. I think historic sites really connect people to the authentic. Uh, the histories they interpret and the connections they make are real, they're tangible, and they can't be mass produced. So today I'd like to introduce you to our sites, uh, give a little bit of background about what makes each site unique, uh, what makes each site significant, and then highlight what goes on at the site today. Uh, what's important to know is that while we do own all eight of these sites, uh, at some of them we partner with an outside organization for interpretation, operations, general maintenance, that sort of thing. And when that's the case in my presentation, uh, I'm gonna mention who that partner is because they all do great work and they all deserve really a lot of credit for our site success. Um, just a little inside baseball, I, I thought a lot about how to structure this presentation. Um, listing the sites geographically from east to west or north to south, that didn't really seem quite fair to me. Um, and then I came up with this idea of listing them in order of distance from my desk and, and that was just a silly idea too. Um, so I decided to list them in order of each property's acquisition by the state. Um, and that becomes interesting because as you'll see, we've been in the historic sites business a long time, almost 80 years. Um, so with, without further ado, to jump right in. Plum Grove. Uh, Plum Grove is the Greek revival home of Robert Lucas, Iowa's first territorial governor, and his family. It's in Iowa City, Johnson County, and was acquired by the state in 1942. It was listed on the National Register of Historic Places in 1973, and at the site we partner with the Johnson County Historical Society for Operations. 
So a little bit of background. Uh, Robert Lucas, uh, he was born in 1781 in what is today Eastern West Virginia, uh, the son of William Lucas, a Revolutionary War veteran and a slaveholding landowner. Robert was a bright student studying mathematics and surveying, and, and like a lot of men of his generation, he followed opportunity in the expanding young nation, moving west uh, to the Northwest Territory in 1800. He involved himself in public life. Uh, he received a commission from the governor to recruit militia. He was elected to the Ohio legislature, uh, serving as both a state rep and a state senator. His military career flourished, and he served honorably in the War of 1812. He developed, uh, during the war, he developed a reputation of being resourceful and brave. He married twice. Uh, his, his first wife, unfortunately, died young. Uh, but in 1816, he married his second wife, a woman with what I think is just a great name, a friendly Sumner. Uh, Lucas was eventually elected twice as Ohio's governor. Uh, and although he gained a reputation for being kind of disagreeable sort, he was popular with the people. In fact, he was so popular that in 1838, Robert Lucas was appointed by President Van Buren to be the first governor of the newly formed Iowa Territory. It was a small territory, but growing fast with towns forming along the Mississippi and up the major waterways. Uh, Robert Lucas arrived in Iowa in August of 1838 and immediately began the work of establishing the government. Again, he was hardworking and resourceful, but somewhat disagreeable and by 1841, the newly elected president, Harrison, replaced Robert Lucas as governor with someone who was more politically friendly. Now, while Robert Lucas was governor, the territorial capital was in Burlington, but plans were already afoot to move it to Iowa City, which had been platted and surveyed in 1839. Governor Lucas began purchasing real estate in Iowa City with the intention of building a home. He wanted to be near the seat of power, whether he was in office or not. In 1844, he began construction on the house that would come to be known as Plum Grove. And interestingly, the deed to the house is in Friendly's name, which was certainly unusual for the time. We don't really know why, uh, but her great grandson offered that maybe Friendly didn't quite trust the governor in large financial matters. So what did Plum Grove look like at the time of its construction? Well, we don't really know for sure. The earliest known photograph we have of it is from the 1930s, and even that shows more than 80 years of renovation and change. Sketches, maps, bird's eye views, that sort of thing from the time suggest a simple design. From evidence that's been uncovered and from contemporary descriptions, we know Plum Grove was well-built and kind of a handsome design, but relatively simple. And the conjecture here is that uh, the appearance of his home matched the character of the governor, who in addition to being disagreeable, also had the reputation of being modest and reserved. Lucas has lived at Plum Grove from 1845 until 1866. And from its earliest days, the property was operated as a farm. It was a working farm. In fact, in the 1850 census, Lucas and one of his sons list their occupations as farmer. That census records that living in the house at the time were the governor, his wife friendly, four children, and one grandchild. In 1853, Robert Lucas died at Plum Grove. And after the governor's death, friendly continued to live there, although she deeded the property to a son. The farm began to be some uh, subdivided with parts going to other children and some parts being incorporated into the growing Iowa City. In 1866, the Lucases sold Plum Grove and friendly moved to a house on Jefferson Street where she died in 1873. By the early 40s, the early 1940s, I should say, Plum Grove had seen five different owners. And although it continued to operate as a farm and had seen additional changes like the addition of a wraparound porch and a west wing, it really had fallen into a state of disrepair. At that time, there were as many as six families living in the house. Although the house was in bad shape, many Iowans recalled its significance and felt its importance. In 1940, some local citizens secured from the property's owner an option to purchase the property and then were able to convince the Iowa Conservation Commission to exercise that option. In 1942, the state assumed ownership of Plum Grove along with four acres of its surrounding grounds. A renovation ensued, employing the best research available in the 1940s and returned Plum Grove to its Lucas era appearance. The Iowa Conservation Commission later became the Iowa Department of Natural Resources, and in 1993, legislative action transferred ownership of Plum Grove from the DNR to the State Historical Society. Though Plum Grove was once part of an 80-acre farm, it's now nestled in really a pleasant Iowa City neighborhood. Today, it's furnished by the National Society of Colonial Dames of America with authentic period artifacts that uh, were common during the Lucas years at the house. 
It's typically open Memorial Day through Labor Day, Wednesday through Sunday, one to five, and then Labor Day through Halloween with some reduced hours, Saturday and Sunday, one through five. Plum Grove uh, usually starts the season with an opening day celebration featuring tours, lawn games, and other activities. During the summer, um, some regular events include programs like the Taste of Plum Grove, a tomato taste, and the Lupus Farms History Day. Uh, we continue to learn a lot about Plum Grove, and, and over the years, archaeologists have done extensive surveys at the site and have uncovered evidence of how the household and farm grew, operated, and changed over time. Uh, so it, it's just interesting to see how the sites can continue to teach us things. Now moving on, uh, hopping in our imaginary car and, and heading north and west, we come to the Abbey Gardner Shark Cabin, which allows visitors to learn one of Iowa's early stories of contact and conflict between Euro-American settlers and native peoples. It's in Arnold's Park, uh, not too far from, from the lake uh, in Dickinson County. It was acquired by the state in 1943, transferred to the State Historical Society in 1959, and listed on the National Register of Historic Places in 1973. At the site, we partner with the Dickinson County Conservation Board for operations. A little bit of background. Uh, by the mid 1850s, the Euro American settlement of Iowa was pushing west and north. In 1856, 12 year old Abby Gardner's family was one of several dozen who had arrived on the shores of the Iowa Great Lakes and decided to put down roots. They arrived late in the season, too late to plant crops, uh, but they brought enough uh, supplies and food that they hoped would last them through the winter. The settlement of the Okoboji region continued the displacement of native peoples, particularly groups of the Dakota who were used to using the area for hunting and gathering. Ink Paduda, seen here much later in life, uh, the leader of one of these Dakota bands had refused to acknowledge earlier treaties between the Dakota and the US government and had, had been involved in several conflicts with settlers, including one where several members of Ink Paduda's band were killed. Government officials at the time recognized that white settlers had started those problems but had refused to apprehend them. So the winter of 1856 and 1857 was particularly harsh. It was a very hard winter and soon both the Okoboji settlers and the Dakota were running out of food and supplies. In March of 1857, Ink Paduta's band arrived at Okoboji searching for food. Tensions ran high as Ink Paduta's people tried unsuccessfully to get food from the settlers. And finally on March 8th, anger turned to violence. For several days, whose band killed 33 settlers and abducted four women, including Abby Gardner. After the Okoboji attack, Ink Paduta's band fled north and then west to the Dakotas, where two of the four captives died. Later that spring, Ink Paduta released Abby and another Okoboji captive after their ransom was paid. Later in life, Abby Gardner married, raised children, and eventually returned to live in Arnold's Park in 1891. There she purchased her family's cabin, operating it as one of Iowa's first tourist attractions until her death in 1921. For a quarter or 10 cents for kids, visitors could see the displays in her log cabin museum, listen to her tell stories of the conflict, her captivity and rescue. As part of her business, Abby Gardner Sharp sold her book entitled, quote, The Spirit Lake Massacre, unquote. Uh, she sold postcards and other souvenirs. In 1941, Abby's son and daughter-in-law sold the cabin to the Iowa Conservation Commission, who later transferred it to the State Historical Society. In 1974, archaeologists and architects conducted research and returned the cabin to its 1856 appearance. The grounds of the site hold a large monument commemorating the Spirit Lake conflict, as well as groups of the Gardner family and others from the area that died in the conflict. Today, the site is a popular regional destination, drawing both visitors from the Lake Okoboji area, as well as further afield. The Gardner Cabin is also popular with school groups, with generations of Northwest Iowans having fond memories of their trips to the site. Today, when you visit the site, uh, you'll find the Gardner Family Cabin, again, which is restored to its 1856 appearance, and you'll find a visitor center that contains exhibits and artifacts. The grounds contain a large monument dedicated to those who died in the conflict, as well as uh, to the rescue party that was sent to receive Abby or retrieve Abby and others from captivity. The graves of the Gardner family and the graves of others who died in the conflict can be found at the site. It is usually open from Memorial Day through Labor Day, Tuesday through Sunday, noon to four. Uh, this summer, the Dickinson County Conservation Board will offer an inaugural car caravan tour of sites involved in the Spirit Lake conflict. You can contact them for, for more information. Uh, it sounds like it's gonna be a great program. And then I'd also just like to point out, recently a memorial boulder was placed at the site 
the names of those that, who died in the conflict that are buried in a group grave at the site. The project was initiated and managed by a fifth grade social studies class who really felt it was important to memorialize those interred in the grave. Before the, the boulder, there was no marker listing the names of those who were buried there. So that fifth grade class did the historical research, did the fundraising, helped with the design of the memorial. And the boulder was unveiled at a ceremony in October. It was, it was really a special occurrence. Next, we have Toolsboro Mounds. At Toolsboro Mounds, visitors uh, encounter some of the best preserved and accessible, accessible remnants of the Havana Hopewell tradition, which was practiced by middle woodland peoples who were present in Iowa, Illinois, and Missouri over 2000 years ago. It's in Louisa County in the town of Toolsboro. It was acquired by the state in 1963. It was listed in 1966, both on the National Register of Historic Places and as a National Historic Landmark. It, it's one of two National Historic Landmarks that are State Historical Society sites. At the site, we partner with the Louisa County Conservation Board. So what was the Hopewell tradition? Well, we know it dates from around 2200 to around 1600 years before the present, during a time period known to archaeologists as the Middle Woodland period. Since we only know the Hopewell people through archaeological excavations and no evidence of written language was preserved, we don't really know, well, we may never know how they referred to themselves. The name of the tradition comes from the name of the landowner where artifacts were first uncovered and not from the name the people called themselves. The Hopewell tradition is defined by a common set of burial practices among certain Native American groups. Uh, the burial of high status individuals in large conical earthen mounds with exotic trade goods. So the term Hopewell refers to this shared set of burial customs and not to a culture. The phrase Hopewell people is used to refer to those groups that participated in similar mortuary rituals and constructed these mounds. The Hopewell tradition in that light can be compared to a present day world religion, an overarching system of beliefs with minor differences on the local and individual levels. The Hopewell lived in villages located along the floodplains of rivers. They built mounds near their villages, typically up on high bluffs. The large clusters of mounds like those at Toolsboro probably served as like a ceremonial center for a region. The Hopewell groups uh, also had an extensive exchange networks indicated by uh, artifacts made from Great Lakes copper, Rocky Mountain obsidian, marine shells and pearls from the Gulf of Mexico, Appalachian mica and shark teeth from the Chesapeake Bay. Their diet was based on hunting and gathering and then also supplemented by some rudimentary agriculture. Going to our site itself, so the Toolsboro site consists of seven burial mounds on a bluff overlooking the Iowa River near its confluence with the Mississippi. The conical mounds were constructed around 2000 years ago by a local Hopewell group. At one time there might have been as many as 12 mounds, but subsequent settlement and excavation have reduced that number to the present seven. And as of yet, no village site near the Toolsboro mounds, near the Toolsboro mounds has been located. Uh, probably because of the shifting path of the Iowa River over the last 2,000 years. Of the seven mounds, two are visible on the grounds near the visitor center, with the rest kind of stretching off into the woods. One of the mounds near the center, measuring 100 feet in diameter and 8 feet high, may be the largest Hopewell mound found in Iowa. So what happened to the Hopewell? Well, around 1,500 years ago, the Hopewell tradition of mound building kind of disappears from the archaeological record, an occurrence that has puzzled scholars. There are two things that could have happened to the people of the Hopewell groups and their traditions. One, they could have shifted south and merged with a later mound building tradition known as the Mississippian. Uh, if you're familiar uh, with Cahokia down in Illinois near, near St. Louis, that's a, that's a Mississippian site. Uh, or two, they could have been absorbed by other local non-Hopewell groups. After the Hopewell, well, European American settlement of the land around the mounds began early in the 19th century. And while cleaning out earth for root cellars and foundations for their farms, as well as just plowing fields, uh, early farmers began the destruction of the mounds. They removed artifacts and human remains from the mounds without uh, any kind of documentation um, or, or sketches or anything like that. And, and that practice was continued by early archeologists, sort of as the discipline was, was being created and developed. But these early archaeologists used crude excavation techniques, causing the loss of artifacts, as well as the opportunity to study the mounds further. Today, under state ownership, no further excavations are being planned for the Toolsboro Mounds. This is for two reasons. First, it's important to remember that the mounds are sacred burial sites, analogous to modern cemeteries. 
And while it's difficult to trace the modern descendants of the Hopewell, further excavations of the burial mounds are nonetheless considered disrespectful. And second, archaeology, while of course immensely valuable, can be a destructive science. Opening the mounds through excavation can destroy the possibility of future study. Artifacts that are removed from a site can never really be replaced in the exact context and position in which they were originally deposited. For sites like Toolsboro, archaeologists prefer non-intrusive methods of exploration, like aerial and satellite photography, magnetometry, and ground penetrating radar, and that's just to name a few. Today, the site includes some of the best preserved and accessible remnants of Iowa's Hopewell culture. Two of the mounds are visible to the public uh, from the visitor center, and that small visitor center contains exhibits and artifacts. It's usually open Memorial Day through Labor Day, Wednesday through Sunday, 1230 to 430, uh, and then Labor Day uh, through Halloween, Saturdays, 1230 to 430. In the fall, the site hosts its annual hands-on history program, featuring museum tours, instruction in flint napping, using an atlatl, grinding corn, and, and prehistoric games. The site also hosts guest speakers, hikes, and more. It's really a great place. So getting in our car, driving north again, we come to Montauk, which is the home of Iowa's 12th governor, William Larrabee, and his family. Visitors to the site see how the Larrabee family lived on this rural estate from 1874 through 1965, and, and a state that still contains unique and original furnishings. It's in Fayette County, uh, in the town of Claremont, kind of up on the hill above the town. It was listed on the National Register of Historic Places in 1973 and acquired by the State Historical Society in 1976. William Larrabee was born in Connecticut in 1832, the son of a distinguished veteran of the War of 1812. He became a school teacher, and in 1853, he decided to move west, eventually to Iowa, in search of greater opportunity. He settled in Claremont, finding work as a farm foreman and teaching school through those cold winter months. But soon, however, he really started to show an aptitude for business. He saved money and in, in, in 1857 bought a half share in the Claremont flour mill. By 1860, he was the full owner and had begun to invest in land. He bought it cheap as soon as he could afford it, and eventually he became one of Iowa's largest landowners. He started a bank in Claremont and eventually invested in other banks across the state. Uh, William Larrabee married Anna Matilda Appleman, another great name, also from Connecticut in 1861. William and Anna raised seven children, four girls, and three boys. His business success eventually led to other opportunities, and William Larrabee enjoyed a long and prosperous career in public service. He was elected state senator in 1867, serving for 18 years. He ran for governor in 1885, was elected, and served from 1886 to 1890. His administration was the first to occupy the newly built state house in Des Moines. Larrabee's progressive ideas sometimes put him at odds with his fellow Republican Party members. He advocated for a form of women's suffrage, regulations on the railroad industry, and expanded rights for African Americans. He held strong views on education, believing in tax-supported education for all students, and advocating the use of historical and cultural artifacts in the classroom. At the time of his death in 1912, he was in the process of building the Larrabee School, intended to put into practice the governor's philosophy of what education should or could be. Mrs. Larrabee became very active in the community of Claremont, serving as the superintendent of the Union Sunday School for 30 years and completing the Larrabee School following her husband's death. She remained involved in family and community life until her death in 1931. The Larrabee children were also involved in a variety of activities suited to their upper class social and economic status. The girls engaged in the arts, which was really one of the few pastimes considered suitable for women at the time. Daughter Anna became an accomplished musician, daughter Augusta an artist. The boys became involved in the family business and two served in the legislature themselves. Anna lived at Montauk until her death in 1965. So a little bit about the house. Uh, Montauk itself was built in 1874 up on that hill overlooking the Turkey River Valley. And it was named by Mrs. Larrabee for a lighthouse at the eastern end of Long Island that kind of family history says uh, would guide her sea captain father home from voyages. The house is surrounded by over 100,000 pine trees that the Larrabee family planted. And the 14 room mansion is built of brick molded of native clay that was fired in a kiln at Claremont. Montauk was a working farm with barns, farm animals, an orchard, and grain fields. 
Montauk reflects the wealth and lofty status of its occupants. The Larrabee family traveled widely and decorated their home with souvenirs from around the world. Visitors to the site today can see Tiffany lamps, Wedgwood china, statues from Italy, music boxes from Switzerland, a large collection of paintings and thousands of books. Each room has a marble sink and most of the rooms are filled with paintings, marble busts or statues. Still, it's really important to know that Montauk is modest compared to the homes of other similarly prominent leaders of Iowa and the nation. This simplicity uh, is tied to and is a product of the Larrabee's conservative New England background. Because the house was lived in continuously for nearly 100 years, the furnishings and appliances reflect changes in technology and style over time. Newer furnishings mixed with older ones. In the kitchen, it's, it's really cool. There's a 1900 wood stove that's just right next to a 1950s dishwasher. The Larrabee family was progressive in its use of technology. The house was built with central heat, a, a newfangled technology in 1874. And other new conveniences were added as soon as they became available. They added a telephone in 1900 and electrified the house in 1910. Today, the site consists of the Larrabee family home with its unique and original artwork and furnishings, a collection of outbuildings related to the operation of the farm, and extensive grounds and trails overlooking the Turkey River Valley. And down the hill in the town of Claremont itself, you'll also find the Union Sunday School and the Claremont Museum, which are operated as part of the site. Montauk is open Memorial Day through Labor Day, noon to four, and then from Labor Day to Halloween, uh, Friday through Sunday, noon to four. Music was important to the Larrabee family, and this is reflected in the site's programming. The Music at Montauk series and winter concerts in the parlor showcase local and regional artists and really bring the house alive. Likewise, the historic Kimball pipe organ at the Union Sunday School is the focus of a summer organ concert series. In later parts of the year, Montauk plays host to a fall festival and a holiday open house. Matthew Beadle Blacksmith Shop, uh, it provides an intimate window into the intersection of agricultural and industrial history in small town Iowa. It's in Marshall County in the town of Haverhill, which is about a 10 or 15 minute drive south of, of Marshalltown. It was listed on the National Register of Historic Places in 1983. It was acquired by the State Historical Society in 1986. And at the site, uh, we partner with the Historical Society of Marshall County. So who was Matthew Edel? Well, seen here much later in life, but he was born in 1856 in or near Stuttgart in the southern part of what is now Germany. In 1869, Matthew emigrated with his family to the United States. They settled in Effingham in central Illinois. We don't know what Matthew's early education in Germany was like, although it is possible like other children of his age at the time, that he may have been involved in the guild system to learn a skilled trade like blacksmithing. Um, his, his later work really would suggest that there might be something there. We do know that while living with his family in the 1870s, Matthew showed a talent for tinkering and inventing what today we might call making. Matthew was a maker. Uh, this was a time when agriculture was becoming increasingly mechanized and Matthew's skills were well known. He received financial backing from his neighbors to invent and promote a wire binder grain harvester, but his timing wasn't great and the much more successful Deering Company's twine binder was released at the same time. So Matthew's wire binder was never financially successful, so he gave it all up and moved west, uh, landing in Iowa City in 1881 or, or possibly early 1882. In Iowa City, Matthew met Mary Hoffman, his future bride. And also while he was in Iowa City, he purchased a half block of property in Haverhill that had been platted in 1882. Uh, he bought it from an agent working from, uh, for the Milwaukee Railroad. <clears throat> the lot that Matthew bought had been improved with a one and one half story building and, and possibly a summer kitchen. In February of 1883, Matthew moved to Haverhill, setting up a blacksmith shop in the downstairs and using the upstairs as, as living quarters. After Matthew and Mary were married in April of that year, she also moved to Haverhill where they lived above the shop for several years until they built a new home on the site. Matthew and Mary had eight children. When Matthew Edel founded his business in the early 1880s, he was working in a rural economy depending on horsepower. So he first worked as a farrier making and fitting horseshoes. In fact, the southwest corner of the shop still has stalls for holding horses uh, while they were being shooed. And in the joists above is a storage area for horseshoes divided into sections that are still labeled with the family names of Matthew's clients. 
Another part of the shop was dedicated to woodworking where Matthew Edel assembled wooden wheels for carriages and wagons and then fit them with iron rims. Another skill he had was in repairing and sharpening farm machinery. And here his forge welding skills really were important. The tools for all of these trades and examples of his work can be seen in all corners of the shop today, just as he left it in 1940. Matthew Edel was an extraordinary small town blacksmith. He was inventive in that usual sense of creating machines and tools, some of which he patented. He was ingenious in setting up his shop to operate efficiently. He was a businessman who made a living adequate to support his large family, no small feat there. He was an artist who designed really beautiful iron cemetery crosses, some of which can still be found in Haverhill Cemetery today. Like other blacksmiths of his day, Matthew designed and built his own workspace. He also handmade most of his iron working tools. The shop was powered by hand at first and later by a six horsepower gasoline engine, which turned a line shaft that ran the shop equipment. The line shaft stretched along the ceiling and its power was transferred to pulleys, or transferred by pulleys and belts to various tools like a, like a bellows, a drill press, a trip hammer, and various saws. The forge is the heart of a blacksmith shop, and Matthew's shop, of course, was no different. To achieve the maximum temperatures that he required to work uh, with iron, uh, the forge required bellows to fan the fire. Matthew used a double action bellows, which was originally powered by a foot pump, and later he connected it to the line shaft for power from that gasoline engine. And then still later, uh, after electrification, he used an electric squirrel cage fan. So the powering of this bellows really illustrates the evolution of the shop and shows Matthew's willingness to switch to new technology when it became available. Aside from specific inventions, Matthew's shop is like a museum of an innovative mind's work. Next to the forge is a trip hammer he fashioned from a railroad car axle. He used materials and scraps at his disposal to build a, a variety of saws, of course, none of which would be OSHA approved today. Sensing a need to adapt to new times, Matthew constructed an addition to his blacksmith shop in 1915 to expand the business to include uh, automobile repair, the newfangled technology of, of the internal combustion engine. From 1915 until Matthew's death in 1940, the business included both the blacksmith shop and the repair garage. And although the garage was operated for some years after Matthew's death, the fires of the blacksmith shop went cold and the shop was largely untouched until it and its vast collection of tools, equipment, materials, and furnishings was donated by Edel family descendants to the State Historical Society. Today, visitors to the site are shown around the Edel blacksmith shop by a knowledgeable docent. It's rare today to find such a complete and original shop that's open to visitors, and, and ours is kept just as Matthew Edel left it before he died. You can see his tools, his inventions, and hear stories about blacksmithing in the age before tractors and automobiles. In addition to the shop uh, on the grounds, visitors can also see the automobile garage, uh, walk around the outside of the Edel family house, and, and see the summer kitchen. The site is typically open Memorial Day through Labor Day, Saturdays and Sundays, noon to four. The Edel Blacksmith Shop is proud to partner with the Upper Midwest Blacksmith Association who have built and operate a modern blacksmith facility on the site and who coordinate a Blacksmith Day celebration typically held in mid-May. Uh, I think they just had it this year. You can see a picture of the modern facility there at the, at the bottom right. Uh, I wish I had a better picture of it open and operating. It's really quite impressive. So moving now just about as far north and west as we can go, we come to the Blood Run National Historic Landmark. At Blood Run, visitors can walk through a beautiful landscape in the footsteps of the Oneota tradition, ancestors of a number of modern day tribal nations. It's in Lyon County, just outside the town of Granite. It, like Toolsboro, is listed both on the National Register of Historic Places and as a National Historic Landmark, and that happened in 1970. It was acquired by the State Historical Society in 1987, and at the site we partner with the Iowa DNR uh, for operations and maintenance. The Blood Run site is located in the northwest corner of the state along the Big Sioux River and Blood Run Creek and is the largest known site of the Oneota tradition. The Oneota were a group of peoples who shared a number of interrelated cultural traits. By around 900 years ago, Oneota was identifiable as a distinct expression of culture that itself had evolved from earlier late woodland traditions. 
Oneota is uh, regarded as a Midwestern phenomenon, and its characteristic villages, cemeteries, and occasionally mound groups are found within an area encompassing Iowa and parts of its neighboring states. What we know of the Oneota comes from archaeology and the oral traditions of their descendant tribes. The Oneota built their villages along large rivers, which were used as a source of food and provided transportation routes for trade. They were hunters and gatherers, hunting bison and elk and gathering acorns, walnuts, raspberries, and plums. And then they supplemented these uh, resources with corn, beans, and squash that were grown in small gardens. Blood Run is the largest Oneota site that we know about. It's between 650 and 1,250 acres, although the site margins have not really been precisely determined, so it could be much larger. Within the site, there are features and artifacts from the prehistoric through the historic periods. Prehistoric is how we refer to the period before written records, and the historic period is how we talk about the time after European contact. So although human presence at the site dates back 8,500 years, which is just mind boggling, its occupation really peaked during the Oneota use about 700 to about 300 years ago when as many as 10,000 people may have lived there, engaging in trade and ceremonial activity. Regular use of the site ceased in the mid-1700s. Due to its location and long history of occupation, Blood Run has been referred to as a, quote, gateway to the cultures of the Great Plains. Of the Oneota sites that have been found, only three of them, all in Iowa, have earthen mounds that were built by the Oneota for human burials. Usually Oneota dead were, bur were buried in cemeteries near their villages or sometimes in mounds built by earlier groups of people. Uh, but at Blood Run, you have Oneota mounds built by Oneotans. <clears throat> A study in the 1880s documented as many as 176 mounds at the site, but now only about 80 remain. Many mounds were reduced or destroyed by agricultural activities. The mounds that we see today probably survived because they were carefully constructed of stone and soils that were selected for durability. Some mounds are still over six feet high and measure 80 feet in diameter despite a century of cultivation. In addition to mounds, other impressive earthworks were once prominent on the Blood Run surface. There was a 15 acre enclosure of heaped up earth that succumbed to the cultivation of crops and a serpent effigy that was reported to be 700 feet in length that's described in early accounts, early written descriptions of the site, but that offers no visible trace today. Other unique surface features include pitted boulders, which are boulders that have had numerous pits ground into their surface. Uh, the largest of these still visible is covered with at least a, a few hundred small ground pits. Uh, we don't know what the purpose of the pits was. It's a matter of speculation. The use of the land by European American settlers began after 1860, and, and cultivation of the land greatly decreased the number of mounds and obliterated any animal effigies or earthen enclosures. We just don't know where on the site they would have been. The portion of the Blood Run site that is owned by the state of Iowa is no longer cultivated and has been returned to native species of prairie grasses. Mounds are generally regarded by Native Americans as holy places, as sacred places. They may contain human remains, and the associated burial artifacts and mounds should always be given the respect due a sacred place. It's also important to know that they are protected by Iowa law. The Oneota tradition, like all cultures, evolved and changed over time. Today, several modern tribal nations who descend from the Oneota have histories and deep cultural connections both to the land and to their ancestors buried at Blood Run. And those tribes are the Iowa tribe of Kansas and Nebraska, the Omaha tribe of Nebraska, the Ponca tribe of Nebraska, the Iowa tribe of Oklahoma, the Ponca tribe of Oklahoma, and the Oto Missouri tribe. Today, visitors to the site can take a self-guided walk along mowed trails to view protected burial mounds, village sites, and other features of cultural interest. The site presents stunning views of rolling prairie, forests, and grasslands, and the Big Sioux River Valley. It's just absolutely breathtaking. Uh, the site's open year-round, sunrise to sunset. Next up, a building you probably don't even need me to name. Uh, visitors to the American Gothic House can immerse themselves into an iconic part of American art history. It's in Wapolo County in the, in the city of Eldon. It was listed on the National Register of Historic Places in 1974. It was acquired by the State Historical Society in 1991. And at the site, our next door neighbor is the city of Eldon's American Gothic House Center. Uh, they're, they're a great neighbor and we love to uh, partner with them on events. 
Let's talk about the house first. So the house was built in 1881 by Charles and Catherine Dibble as a home for them and their eight children. Uh, the house today is still some kind, sometimes called the Dibble House. Its design is in some ways typical of 19th century domestic architecture in Iowa. Its size, its massing, how it's put together, its board and batten siding, its color, all of these are common and you can find examples of them all around the state. But what makes the house unusual and special are its steep pitched roof and its two gothic or pointed arch windows in the gables, one in the front, one in the back. Those features are part of the Carpenter Gothic style, which was an application of the Gothic Revival architectural style as applied to wooden structures built by house carpenters. Carpenter Gothic grew out of a need for quickly built homes and a desire at the same time for fanciful details. A little bit of flair. So the Dibble family, moving back to them, they lived in the house until 1897, after which it changed hands several times. At one point during this period, it served double duty as a home and as a store for candies and novelties. Uh, and as far as my seven-year-old is concerned, uh, we should return it to that, to that use. Um, the home was eventually purchased by Gideon and Mary Hart Jones in 1917, and it was the Jones family who were approached in 1930 by an artist named Grant Wood who was seeking permission to include their home in a painting he was working on. We'll get back to Grant Wood in a moment. After the Jones family, Selden and Myra Smith bought the house in 1942 and their son Carl inherited it in 1960. He maintained it until 1991 when he gave it to the State Historical Society of Iowa. That visitor center I mentioned, our next door neighbor, uh, was built by the city of Eldon in Wapalo County and it opened in 2008. So Grant Wood, he was born in 1891 near Anamosa and moved to Cedar Rapids when he was 10. He was a painter from a very young age. He studied at uh, an art school in Minneapolis and then later enrolled at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. He was a traveler. He went to Europe eight times in the 1920s, studying Impressionism and the Post-Impressionists. He returned to Iowa where his work began to align with a style known as regionalism. This style was popular in the 20s and 30s and got its name from the artists who painted the natural landscapes and the people of the Midwest, especially here in Iowa. Regionalism was unique in its time because it depicted familiar subjects in realistic ways and is sometimes, it's one of those forms of art that's sometimes called the first uniquely American style of art. So Grant Wood was visiting the city of Eldon in 1930 to attend an art exhibition. One afternoon while being driven around the town, he saw the Dibble House and taken with its modest stature and unusual ornament, he asked the driver to pull over and he made a basic sketch on the only paper he had, uh, which was I think the back of an envelope. He returned the next day, talked to the owners, obtained their permission and began a more detailed sketch. Returning to his studio in Cedar Rapids would produce the painting that we know today. The figures in the painting, a farmer and his daughter, were modeled by Wood's sister and his dentist. The painting now bore the title American Gothic, and it was the first of Wood's work really to receive attention outside of Iowa. Up to that point, he was well known within the Cedar Rapids community and had received awards at the Iowa State Fair, but few people outside of the state knew of his art. The painting was entered in a competition at the Art Institute of Chicago, where it took a bronze medal and a $300 prize, and it remains in the Art Institute's collection to this day. Initially seen as a satire of small town life, it received, really received pushback from some Iowans who thought they were being portrayed as straight laced and prim and, and rather boring. They thought they were being made fun of, but Wood really rejected these interpretations. He wanted to positively reflect American values of the heartland. The painting then in that light can be seen as a depiction of the American pioneer spirit. American Gothic has become a well-known image of Americans and Midwesterners, especially Iowans. If imitation is the sincerest form of flattery, then the painting has been flattered by various parody images. Kermit the Frog and Miss Piggy. Uh, you can see examples with Darth Vader and Princess Leia. Uh, I've got Rick and Morty up on the screen. Um, it's been recreated in TV and films. Uh, Rocky Horror Picture Show comes to mind. It can be found on a variety of products like magnets, ties, t-shirts. The original pair shows up in many different settings. Uh, some Iowa flood years, they've been depicted underwater. Uh, they've been shown in pictures hanging out with figures from other well-known paintings like Mona Lisa, Whistler's Mother, The Screamer from The Scream. When visiting the site today, you'll find that, Ameri that iconic American Gothic house with ample inspiration for your own art, whether that means a selfie or even bringing your own easel to recreate a masterpiece. 
Next door, as I mentioned, is the City of Eldon's American Gothic House Visitor Center, which maintains exhibits on Grant Wood and his work, as, really just a, as well as really just a charming gift shop. The grounds of the site are open year round, sunrise to sunset, and the city's visitor center is open Wednesday through Saturday, 10 to 4, and then Sunday, 1 through 4. Of note at the site, uh, the American Gothic House was recently featured in a music video by the Iowa based music duo, the Brazilian Twins or the B Twins. That video is available on our YouTube page and really is just a lot of fun. It's, it's great to see a site and performers elevate each other and in the process create something special and new. And then our final site we'll talk about today is the Western Historic Trail Center. At the Western Historic Trail Center, visitors learn about the role that Iowa played in the opening of the American West. It's in Council Bluffs in Pottawatomie County. It was built in the 90s and was acquired by the state in 1997. Created by a partnership with the National Park Service and the city of Council Bluffs, the Western Historic Trail Center tells the story of Western migration, those individuals who explored, blazed trails, and followed those who passed before, eventually knitting the U.S. together from sea to shining sea. At the center, visitors learn about the following trails and explorations. So first up is the Lewis and Clark Trail. Uh, that, of course, follows the journey of the Corps of Discovery from the Mississippi to the Pacific, which was one of the most monumental episodes in the early history of the Republic. Uh, Thomas Jefferson really wanted knowledge about the geography, people, plants, animals, minerals, and weather of the Louisiana Purchase. Uh, this was a place where it was rumored that woolly mammoths still existed, where there were blue-eyed Indians who spoke Welsh, and most, most importantly, where an all-water Northwest Passage provided an easy route across the continent. Uh, Jefferson chose his personal secretary, Meriwether Lewis, who uh, reached out to his former commanding officer, William Clark, to be co-commander. And in 18, uh, 1804, uh, they and the Corps set out on an 8,000 mile round trip journey that did secure the US's claim to the land, uh, that did establish trade and diplomatic relations uh, with two dozen native nations uh, and more, but never really found that water route to the Pacific. The site also talks about the Oregon Trail. In the early 1830s, waves of settlers looking for cheap land and a new life began to journey overland to the Oregon country from the United States. The trail west began at a string of frontier towns along the Missouri River and crossed the plains before heading into the Rocky Mountains and then down the Columbia River. At the far end of the trail, emigrants gradually established farms and settlements throughout the Willamette Valley and into what is now Washington State. Uh, the journey of 2,000 miles that these, uh, that these people undertook was alternately tedious and dangerous with dangers like disease, exposure, and accidents. Uh, their arrival in Oregon laid a strong American claim to the Pacific Northwest, and before long, the United, United States would stretch across the continent. So the California Trail is, is next up. Uh, the discovery of gold, of course, at Sutter's Mill in California, Sierra Nevada Mountains set off a flood of immigrants suffering from gold fever. Uh, these would-be miners came to be known as 49ers after 1849, the year in which many of them set their sights on California. Uh, they were mostly men and maybe unsurprisingly often unprepared for their journey, uh, but they followed the Oregon Trail before splitting off and heading southwest across mountain ranges and deserts. Some of them did strike it rich, but most returned home discouraged as mining boomtowns faded and panning for gold was replaced by industrialized mining. Others, however, stayed and eventually built the towns and cities that would attract people uh, from all over the world to the Golden State. And then finally, the Mormon Trail. Um, religious persecution in the US forced groups belonging to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints to find new homes for themselves where they could practice their beliefs in peace. Their trek west from Illinois began in 1845 as they crossed the muddy prairies of Iowa to the Missouri River. Here they established numerous camps and small villages, including Canesville, which became modern day Council Bluffs. From the Missouri River camps, they followed the Platte River west across Nebraska and into Wyoming, and then eventually turned south into the Valley of the Great Salt Lake. There they built their city of, uh, of Salt Lake in a land that would one day become the state of Utah. Today, the center offers visitors an orientation to the four historic trails I mentioned and an exhibit gallery that features interpretive displays and original sculptures by artist Tim Woodman. Unfortunately, it, it remains closed uh, due to the pandemic, but typically its open hours are Thursday through Sunday, 9 to 4.30 uh, from April through the end of September, and then some slightly reduced hours in the fall and winter months. 
When it's open, the Western Historic Trail Center welcomes a variety of school, social, and special interest groups for tours and programs. Um, and they, they do uh, a weekly bluegrass and folk music jam session. It, it's, a, it's a lot of fun. So that's the sites. Uh, before we go, though, I, I do want to share an exciting opportunity available through the Historical Marker Program. Now, our historical markers raise awareness of Iowa's rich cultural history. And like our historic sites, they also connect Iowans to the things that make the state unique. Historical markers are often encountered spontaneously while traveling across the state and create unexpected and real connections with a place and its history. In commemoration of Iowa's 175th anniversary of statehood, we have established a grant program allowing individuals and organizations to erect their own historical markers that will tell the story of the people and places that have shaped land now known as the state of Iowa. The program is designed to give priority to markers which will highlight stories of historically underrepresented groups. Grants of up to $2,000 per marker will be available for the manufacture of a 24 by 36 cast aluminum historical marker. For more information, I, I put the URL up on the screen. It's a little bit of a mouthful, but you can also go to iowaculture.gov and just in the search box, search historical markers. It should take you right there. So that's my presentation. I, I thank you for your time. Uh, before we get to questions, I just really quick want to thank my colleagues, Hannah Frederick, Leo Landis, Becky Plunkett, Mary Bennett, and Charles Scott for their assistance and patience, most importantly patience, as I assembled the, my presentation. And, and I'd also like to thank the Office of the State Archaeologist and the Cedar Rapids Museum of Art, both of whom were, were a big help. And with that, I would be happy to answer any questions. Uh, well, thank you, Mike. Uh, we have a few minutes to answer some questions at this time. However, before I pose the first question, I just want to remind our participants, you can still submit your questions through the Q&A feature. Uh, we are on a schedule, though, so please note we may not be able to get to all the questions before the end of the webinar. But here's our first question for you. Uh, why are some sites managed by partners and some managed by the State Historical Society? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. And, and it's, it's a long-standing relationship. Um, I, I think the the state historical sites program has has sort of grown organically over time, and so the ones that are operated by sites partners, um, my understanding is that uh, kind of on acquisition of those sites, or as 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 the state historical uh, society started to operate those sites, it was determined that uh, it would be kind of more efficient and effective to partner with a local organization who had. Um, some kind of more specialized local knowledge to help us run those sites. Uh, so in those cases, uh, our sites partners, uh, you know, coordinate the staffing and, and really play a large role or the primary drivers of, of public programming, but all in coordination with us back in Des Moines. Um, we, we, we talk about the tours and the programs and, and um, you know, identify areas we want to pursue and room, room for improvement and stuff like that. It really is a collaborative relationship and one that I think has worked quite well. And to kind of tie into that first question, um, how do historic sites impact their communities today? Yeah, you know, I stole that, I stole that line uh, at the outset, and then I think I, I um, mentioned it later on, uh, people, places, and points of pride. Um, I, I borrowed that from uh, the Department of Cultural Affairs um, annual report or mission statement. Uh, anyway, I like it a lot uh, because I think in the case of historic sites, that's really in a lot of ways what they do. They are these connections. And so within a community, a historic site can be that point of pride that gives a community uh, its significance or a character defining feature of that community. It really can be one of the things that a community can hold up as, as who they are and what's important to them. Um, you know, they also can be, in some ways, an economic engine. Uh, they employ people, especially, um, you know, we talked about our sites partners, you know, uh, this, these are, are local individuals being employed at a, at a, a local site, um, and, and they bring tours from, you know, local, regional, statewide tours to the sites, in, in some cases from outside the state, and, and so they can really uh, be a good economic tool. Um, and, and I think, I was in uh, a discussion earlier this week where we, we talked about the notion of the authentic, and, and I think I might have included a little bit, a little bit in that here. Um, you know, our, our, our modern world uh, has a lot of good things uh, in it, uh, but sometimes I believe us to be at risk of losing touch with those things that are authentic, that are real. And I think at historic sites, 
those are great places to go to feel that connection um, to something that isn't mass produced, that doesn't look the same everywhere. Um, I think those can be really important to a community. Well, our next question, um, are there any plans to bring on, <clears throat> excuse me, are there any plans to bring on new historical sites? That's a, that's a great question and, and one which I am asked from time to time. Uh, there are no current plans to bring on additional sites, uh, but we do have uh, a set of, uh, I guess for lack of a better term, acquisition criteria. So we, we do have a guideline of, of what we would look at uh, when considering bringing on an additional historic sites. And, and that's everything. It's sort of a comprehensive list, but it's, it's everything from the historical significance, uh, its prevalence of, of similar examples in the state and, and the region. Um, it, it looks at the financial picture. Does it make financial sense not only to acquire, but then to continually operate the site? So it's a number of factors to work through um, when considering. And so, and so uh, while there are no active plans to acquire additional historic sites at the time, uh, if, if that should change, I think that we're well positioned to think through uh, kind of the who, what, when, where, why, and, and make a smart informed decision um, that is both respective of history to be interpreted as well as responsible care of state tax dollars. And our last question for today, uh, what recommendations do you have for people when visiting the sites? What recommendations do I have? You know, I think I, that's a great question and I don't know that I have a great answer for that. Um, what I would say is um, if you're thinking about going to one of the sites, um, go to our website first. Um, you can go to iowaculture.gov uh, in the search box, just type historic sites, it'll take you to our page. Each of our sites has a website um, dedicated to it that will give you some of the logistics, the nuts and bolts of, of location and hours and contact information. There's also a site history um, for all the sites and most sites also have a teacher's guide. These are PDF documents that are quick to download and give you some additional background uh, on the site and its significance. Uh, fair warning, you may recognize uh, some of my words that I have said out loud today. You might find them again in some of these site histories and teacher's guides. Uh, but they're a great way to, to give you some additional context uh, of a site before you visit. I would also recommend uh, when you're on that web page, just picking up the phone and calling the site and um, just letting them know when you're coming, um, you know, what interests you? Are, are you interested in 19th century history? Are you interested in uh, the history of, of Native American culture? Uh, are you, you know, whatever you're interested in, tell them that. And, and see what recommendations they would have for how to engage with the site when you're there. But I think I think both of those could really kind of elevate your experience. Perfect, and with that answer, we will close out our webinar. Uh, I think we all can agree it's been a very informative lunch and I have a long travel list of things to do <laughs> after hearing about everything today. You're welcome also, anytime. Yeah, also thank you everyone joining us today. We hope everyone will sign up for the Iowa History 101 webinars that take place on the second and fourth Thursdays throughout the year. There are many great stories from Iowa's past to tell in the upcoming months. Now, for more information and to register for future webinars in this series, check out our website at iowaculture.gov. This webinar and past presentations are available on our website as well. And while you're there, you can look into some of our other fantastic digital programs, such as our Goldie's Kids Club activities, if you're in historians, or watch video recordings of the Iowa Story series, which is hosted by our Iowa City branch. I thank you again for joining us today and have a great afternoon. We look forward to virtually seeing you Thursday, June 10th for our next Iowa History 101 webinar. Thank you, everyone.